I'm going. And okay, well, listen, uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today for our another, another uh, in our series of virtual lunch and learns. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about HOA success stories, managing the escalating water budget, which is, uh, which is a big issue for a lot of you uh, today as you're going about your jobs. Um, I'm Richard Restucia. I'm uh, Vice President of Water Management Solutions for Jane Irrigation and uh, ET Water. And one thing I think about and deal with almost daily in my job is uh, managing water and uh, particularly the water in HOAs. And I think about uh, the technology we have today and the people we have to manage water. And I think why aren't 100% of the HOAs using smart controllers and figuring out ways to manage the water that they have uh, more efficiently. And a lot of times I know it, uh, it, it comes down to uh, HOA operations, interactions, and process. So uh, today we put together a board, uh, a team here today that's really going to help all of us with this process, right? Uh, this seems to be uh, some of the tougher things that we have to deal with, and we've got some people that have experienced it and and uh, and worked their way through it in uh, in a really positive way. So hopefully they're going to share uh, some ideas and some tips to uh, help you all manage your HOAs better, and uh, or uh, if your contractors uh, working within HOAs understand how to do that a little better. So. Uh, with that, I want to introduce our panel. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to introduce Ken Olson. Uh, Ken's uh, president of Olson Business Solutions. Um, you know, prior to working as the uh, uh, managing partner at Olson Business Solutions, Ken was the general manager of Sun City Grand in, um, in, um, in Surprise, Arizona. Now, for those of you who don't know Sun City Grand, this is a massive HOA, 4,000 homes. 20,000 residents. It is a, uh, it's a big job. Anybody, I'm from Phoenix, so uh, anybody who's been in that area knows what a, uh, uh, what a great community that is to live in. It's been famous for years, and uh, so, so Ken, uh, Ken, being the general manager for that, uh, helped them implement a lot of water management strategies and had some really successful uh, uh, results uh, as, from his work. So we're, we're real happy to have uh, Ken here with us today. Uh, also from the Arizona area or the Phoenix area is Jim Clough. And um, Jim is, hi Jim, Jim's president of Aquatrack Systems. He's a uh, water management consultant that works with HOAs. He's literally saved HOAs uh, in Arizona millions of dollars in water over the years. You know, all of our, our uh, panelists today uh, really have been managing water on a, on a large scale. And so a uh, million dollars of water, that's, that's not really a scary number to them. Anyway, uh, Jim's, uh, Jim's got some great certifications. The one I like the most though is he's a select certified landscape irrigation auditor. And um, he's also a select certified landscape water manager. There's only about 95 of those total in the whole United States. And Jim, Jim holds that certification. It's a tough one to get. And we're fortunate to have him here today uh, to, to help us through this uh, subject. Um, joining us also is uh, Rebecca Paulin. And uh, Rebecca is a uh, landscape manager for Rossmore. This is a beautiful community of about 1,800, I'm sorry, 1,800 acres and 10,000 residents in the Walnut Creek area. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful community. They've done a lot for water management over the years. Uh, this also uh, is a show place for community managers and a great representation of what a, uh, a community, a good community should look like and operate like. Um, <clears throat> Rebecca is also a, uh, a landscape designer and uh, she's also a Valley Crest alum. So uh, we welcome uh, Rebecca to our uh, panel today. And then uh, finally, we have Andy Bellingeri, uh, National Sales Manager for ET Water. And uh, Andy is also a Valley Crest alum uh, and uh, has worked as a uh, account manager for Valley Crest. Uh, Andy came out of BYU with a degree in horticulture and has been in this industry for uh, really all his working life. Uh, Andy's gonna bring the perspective of the manufacturers to this discussion today, as well as uh, a contractor perspective because he's got both of those too. So anyway, everybody welcome to, uh, to, the, to, uh, to our panelists and thank you guys so much for joining us today. So um, I, I wanna get started here uh, and, and really my, my first question is, uh, is to Ken. 
And Ken, you know, I gave a brief description of uh, Sun City Grand, but uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about Sun City Grand, specifically your time there uh, and, and what that community is, is like? Yeah, it's actually a little bigger. We actually have uh, 9,800 homes there and about 17,000 residents. And uh, I'm, I'd have to ask Jim, Jim, how many uh, common area acres do we have there? Not golf course, but just common area. Was it around what? What was the it's exact number? Three, 380. Yeah, that's right. I always, I always think 450. I don't know why. But we have a lot of acreage there. But, you know, we've, uh, it's been, it's really an interesting community because every time we look at something, uh, they are really forward thinkers there and they really want to do the right thing. And so uh, one of the things that we did there in that community, and I've been there six years, and my background's engineering. And then I went in and got a real estate property management degree. And uh, one of the things that I like is I like to develop and innovate and help bring new, new, you know, deliver new systems, new management uh, ideas to the community. And so one of the things I like is conservation, energy and water are my real big things right now. And uh, so we got started just to give you a little quick uh, history with a water committee probably back right after I started in 2014. And that was uh, very, they were just very interested in trying to conserve water. And there was a couple of uh, gentlemen on the community. One actually had a insight into Jim and I knew of Jim because I used to be senior vice president at first service. So we felt that we needed some help and we wanted to deliver, deliver something more to our residents in terms of savings. So we had no idea what we could do or what we could save. We, all we knew is we, need, we needed to upgrade our equipment. We talked to Gothic, our landscaper. And I said, you know, this thing is so big and this community is so large, we have no idea what we're really doing. So we wanted to go out and get professional help. And a lot of people said, I need professional help, but especially here we do. <laughs> and it was really important that uh, we look to somebody like Jim and Gothic had heard of Jim, and so we walk, worked with our water committee and actually ended up doing some research. And, and then the first thing we did is we called them up and said, okay, here's what we're trying to do. What, how big is this problem? And we didn't even know how, what we really should, how we should even approach it. So, uh, and whether you're large or small, I think that's pretty symptomatic of, of uh, managers and boards because they don't really have this kind of a, a specific background. Yeah, so Ken, this is the real this is the real question or the real thing I'm wondering is what you know kind of stimulated this? Was it just looking at that water bill every month and the board finally said, gee, we better do something about this? Or did you have to bring the idea? How how did that go, right? Because this is really the first step and the and and a big challenge for most of us. Well, a lot of us look as managers, you know, our, our method of 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 doing our water budget every year is by taking a look at last year and saying, well, let's see. I think with increases, we better allow about 10% increase. That's how we did our water budgets, okay, dollar-wise. The numbers started getting really out of hand, and the landscaper was really kind of uh, tried getting equipment in there uh, about two, three, four years before I started. And the board wasn't too gung-ho on that because they didn't really feel it was relevant. I mean, what do we need and how much do we need and how do you, are you going to make sure it's going to work? They couldn't connect all the dots. And I think the stimulating factor was really, you look at the budget sheet and it was, uh, it, was really, it was really a bigger number. And they just felt that we could do better than this. And our equipment was really getting old and falling apart. We had uh, a system that wasn't adequate and we all knew it wasn't adequate. So uh, Gothic would tell me, Ken, we gotta do something about this. And uh, nobody really listened to us before. So how are we gonna get this started? So the water committee was formed. I was integral in that along with the, uh, uh, the board members, and we had board members sitting on that committee. And that's how we started going through this discovery process. And quite frankly, the board let us do our own thing. We, just, we kept giving reports to the board until finally we said, hey, look, we've got this guy we talked to. We want him to come in and talk to everybody. And then we can work out, based on his recommendations, what he would perceive the, uh, the cost to be to get something done. So yeah. it was kind of a, a dollar was a driver. Dollar right, reserve. right. Which uh, which we know, right? The best way to get people to conserve, unfortunately, in the past has been to uh, raise prices. We're all working to change that, but uh, we still have a little bit more work to do. So, uh, 
So Jim, you, you come into this, they ask you to come in and uh, take a look at the property. What, what's kind of the first thing that you do as you, you know, when you arrive? Well, not just at Sun City Grand, but any property, golf course, resort, university, municipality, when they call me in, the first and foremost thing I do is figure out how much water the landscape needs. So we do calculations of the turf, we measure the turf, we measure the DG areas. We look at the density of the DG, and then uh, we get the uh, annual ET rate for the area, whether it's Las Vegas, San Francisco, Chicago, wherever, and we figure out what the budget would be based on ET. So if you have, um, if you're in Arizona, uh, and you have an acre of turf in Arizona, based on historical ET, you need about a million six hundred thousand gallons a year to sustain the turf. So what we did is the first thing we did at Sun City Grand is we came up with a budget, Richard, because everything starts with a budget. Once we came up with a budget, then we looked at what they were actually using, and we were able to see, okay, here's where we're at. Here's the budget for the property. And the budget for Sun City Grand, when we first looked at it, was 110 million. And they were averaging 134 million. There were some years where it was up over 150. But the budget for the property, based on ET, it was 110 million. Now, and this is just me now, uh, ET is the max of our budget. So uh -huh. just to give you a for instance, so the budget at Sun City Grand will always stay 110 million gallons, but last year we used 87 million gallons. So we're always under our budget. So, but the budget is based on ET. It's very similar to the way the Arizona Department of Water Resources does an allotment for a facility that has over 10 acres of turf grass. They take the amount of turf you have and they give you a budget and that's based on ET and they use the same number. 1.6 million gallons of water per year per acre of turf. So it started with a budget. And then if, if let's say the budget is close to the usage, well, there really isn't any need for us to step in there because they're doing a great job with the water. Uh, unless it's just the equipment's old and you know it's, it's not there. But generally, I have never done a budget and compared it to the actual water usage and it was even close, ever, not once. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Now, now uh, Jim, for some of our viewers, uh, could you help them out with a definition of ET if they're not familiar with evapotranspiration? <laughs> well, I, I, at this point, I usually do a little demonstration with a cup of water where I, I pour <laughs> water in a cup and I, it shows a level here, and then I drink some out of it and it goes down there. And I say ET is just simply replacing the water, the moisture in the soil that's evaporated and been taken out by the plants. But then I take the cup and I pour water in it and I let the water overflow the cup so they can see what they're doing. Yeah. So what ET is, it's evapotranspiration. It is the evaporation rate and the transpiration rate of the plant. So basically it's the moisture being removed out of the soil by evaporation and by the usage of the plants. That's ET. Yeah, excellent, thank you. So basically if we're measuring ET and just filling it, uh, the soil back up to its uh, uh, saturation point, this is a great way to manage uh, landscape. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah, okay, all right, great, thank you. So um, Rebecca now, when, and so Rossmore, right, this has been a, uh, uh, you know, Bert Sperber at Valleycrest uh, first HOA to manage uh, back in uh, the, the mid 70s, right? It was a, a big name. Everybody around Valleycrest knows about Rossmore and, and what a great community it is. Um, now you came into that community after uh, smart controllers were installed, correct? And so uh, how does your experience differ, right? What is your communication with boards? So what is that like? What do they want to hear from you? What do they want to know from you? A lot of people want to know how the system works, which, you know, is data driven, is weather driven, and frankly, is far more high tech than most people that are not in the irrigation world are capable of comprehending just because, you know, they don't speak that language. You know, Jim, for example, mentioned that each landscape has a budget, right, depending on how hot it is and what kind of water the plants you're using need. And those calculations um, are 
a rocket science, frankly. You have to do a lot of conversions. You have to know exactly what your ET is. You have to know what the weather is like. Um, so it's difficult to explain that to people. But um, we did convert in starting in 2006. And we have a, we use about $6 million in water here. Um, but only about half of that goes to the landscape. But when we first converted over to smart controllers, it was an instant savings of 20%. Um, so that's how much uh, buffer room there is between um, managing a system manually and managing a system according to the weather. Because, you know, people think California is warm and sunny all the time. And in some places it is, but it's, it's also really variable. So it rained really hard here two days ago. Today it's in the 70s. And next week it might be in the 90s. So the amount of water that you're putting down on the landscape is going to vary a lot from one day to the next. And so that's really the purpose of having these smart controllers is that it self adjusts for that. And frankly, I don't know how anybody did it before smart controllers were a thing. Um, because, you know, you'd have to manually change each controller. And for us, we have more than 400 controllers. So if you're trying to do that on a daily or a weekly basis, that's, it's just not tenable. Yeah, I think you really make a great point here uh, because, um, you know, lots of people would say, well, gee, aren't you kind of, you know, um, throwing the contractor under the bus when you do that? Well, no, it's just not physically possible to get out and make an adjustment every day to 400 controllers, right? It, I mean, you could do it. Nobody would want to pay for it. And uh, <laughs> certainly the uh, ROI wouldn't be there. So it really is the technology that, uh, that made the difference now. And uh, I think that's a really good point, Rebecca. Thanks. Yeah, and and to, to throw something in and tag team with what Rebecca said, is it grand? Uh, that was one of the issues that the water committee said, well, we got all these controllers. How do you manage all this? And Gothic said, it's really hard to spend, you know, with what, what we're paying, you know, them to really go in and really adequately service this to really do what we need to get done. And so we all recognize we had an issue that we really physically just couldn't physically get it done. And so I think that that's why with, uh, with uh, Jim, Jim's help and Aquatrack working with Gothic and then laying out a, a schedule and a plan of how we'd go about doing it, I thought was really effective. And one of the things that I think was really important that uh, is one of the things that I do, is, is, you know, as a manager was, you know, we have to build a business case to be able to convince the residents and the board that it's worth the money and the value propositions there. And I think that, you know, the things that uh, Rebecca was saying really makes a lot of sense. And you can see that that's kind of gearing where we started the conversation. But then again, we didn't have the background that Jim had in terms of, hey, he said, you know, we need to check all your water bills. We need to check and make sure your billing is proper we can actually maybe reduce some of the size of your valves. And after all, that impacts your, your, you know, your fee and, and it ultimately impacts sewer, all these different things. And I thought, wow, this thing is really integrated in fully. And then he, he went through this list after list of how we start, you know, I had to start with the budget, then the audit, all these different things. And I think what was really important is we recognized right away that this is pretty complicated and we needed to build a strong business case and bring that forward. So it took us, I don't know how many months, Jim, did it take us to build uh, the case so we could actually bring that to the board? Because I remember they voted on that in May because I was at a convention when they were voting on that. How many months did it take us to develop that? It, it, from, from the start it, it, to where the board could look at the information, it was about three, four months. Yeah, yeah. but it was yeah. really well worth the time. So I can't emphasize enough that you know, build a business case and engagement of the of the residents. And I, in this case, you know, our residents were actually on that committee with me. And then we pulled Jim into it. And then he was doing, uh, you know, beta testing. And maybe he could get into what he did with the testing of the different controllers to demonstrate. We didn't know which controllers we should even buy. Right. And he said, I'm not, listen, I'm not selling controllers, but I want to get you fit with the right ones. So Jim, you want to relate that story? I thought that was really fascinating the way we did that. I thought it was really a good approach to the problem. Well, um, first of all, um, the, the first step we had to do was convince the board to pay for the audit. And what, what, what helped convince the board to pay for the audit is Gothic, the landscaper that I was working with, jumped up and said, listen, we'll pay for half of it. So that really made the pill easy to swallow for the board. 
uh, because their their vendor, you know, their partner out there was all for this. So so we started the audit, and then when we started the audit, you know, it was pretty much um, a given uh, for us when we went out there that the system that was out there was over 20 years old, and they were keeping it together with duct tape and wire. Uh, a lot of the two wire path underneath the ground was gone. The main computer wasn't connect, wasn't communicating with the CCUs, you know, this whole story, the CCUs weren't communicating with the controllers. So we had so much going on out there. It was physically impossible if it rained for Gothic to run around the place, like, you know, uh, uh, a fire drill and start turning off controllers everywhere because they couldn't do it from the main controller. But so when we got into the audit, we discovered the things in the audit that we needed to do. And one of the things that we realized right away was, would the water savings pay for all of this? See, we did the budget. We looked at the, the case, the amount, the history of the water usage there and the cost. And when we could determine that the, the savings, that there would be a return on investment so that because of the introduction of smart controllers, and I, 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 wanna, I wanna emphasize this, smart controllers are not something you put on the wall and walk away from, right, Rebecca? Right, it's not the smart controller that does the savings. It's all the legwork in the field, staying on top of the efficiency and everything else. Does the smart controller help? Tremendously. But if, if, if people are thinking, gee, if I just buy a spark controller for my HOA, my water bill is going to go down, everything's going to work out great. Everybody on this panel knows, and everybody who's listening that's in the industry knows, that's not true. Would you agree, Rebecca? Well, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? Because it will water according to what you tell it is going on in the landscape. What kind of irrigation do you have? What kind of plants do you have? Are you in full sun or are you in shade? Are you on a hill? There's a lot of information that you have to put in there so that it waters appropriately. Um, and then also you have to then return to it after a couple of years when your plants have evolved, they've grown, they've you know, gone from being in an establishment period to being more deep rooted. And then of course you have to wrap into that, um, you know, no amount of data and satellite controllers are gonna save you from bad coverage, right? Because if you have a broken sprinkler head or if you have bad coverage, the plants aren't gonna get water regardless of what the controller says. So absolutely, this is you know one component of a well-managed irrigation system, um, but it, it takes a whole lot off of your plate so that you can focus on those other things that really you know require human interaction. Now, now there is a difference in smart controllers. So what we did was we don't at Aquatrack we don't sell any equipment. We don't we don't we don't distribute anything. We're not connected to any landscape company or distributor or anything like that. So what we do is we beta test. So we said to at Sun City Grand, why don't we take the four leading smart controllers, throw them up on the wall and let's run them for 30, 45 days and, and let's see you know, what it's like. We looked at categories like how easy was it to install? How easy was it to program? What kind of information were we able to input into it to do the programming? Uh, how long did it take to get it connected to the cloud so it actually worked, right? Uh, and so we did these parameters uh, that we said, okay, then when, after we got it programmed, we took irrigators, irrigation technicians from the field and went out into the field with them and let them access the system via their phone or an iPad because we wanted to see how user-friendly this was going to be. So we looked at all these, we took four of the major smart controllers and we went out there and we did all of this. And then we took the input from the landscaper Gothic and, 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 and all the information we gathered and we presented it to the board. And we said, here's the findings and this is what we found out. And then the board made the decision to go with ET water and that's why they went with ET water. And Jim, do you remember one of the things that was critical and I, I really believe that ownership and creating stakeholders in this process is important that we went out and did the demo uh, and we used the ET controllers, right? And we Correct. were actually, Correct. we the board actually watched us go from site to site and how we could turn them on with the phone and do different things and how the controllers work. Because right other than looking at a piece of paper and some literature, the board really wasn't very well connected to what it was. So 
I, I really can't emphasize enough for anybody out there that engaging the board mm -hmm. actively in, I, I, there's nothing better than an on-site visit, whether you're buying stuff for pumps for your swimming pool, or if you're out there and it's irrigation equipment, get them out in the field. And you know, they love a field day. They love field days. And <laughs> they go out there, seriously, they do. And yeah. it's really exciting because they, when they come to that, we have a workshop and a board meeting every month. And so they, they were a lot more intelligent on the conversations in the workshop and much better able to make an informed decision when they had the information, they could see it up front. And, you know, that made all the difference in the world. And quite frankly, it made everything just go through just as smooth as can be because they understood the system better because they could actually see it working. So I want to emphasize how important that is to include them in that process. Yeah, it's, it's so true. If I just, uh, if I go outside out in my front yard and turn on my irrigation with my phone, uh, invariably a neighbor will come over and say, did you just turn your irrigation on with the phone? I mean, they're fascinated with the technology and that's so, so little of what the technology does, but they, you know, people really do, when they see it, get, get excited about it. I know in talking to you know, my tech friends, they say, oh, we had no idea that water management got so technical and after they get involved, uh, it, it does get interesting. Um, one, one thing I wanted to ask you, Andy, and it goes back to what Jim was saying that um, it's, it's uh, rare, maybe uh, there has been not an exception in which um, ET and a water budget has actually equaled the uh, water use at a uh, HOA. Has, has that been your experience too, uh, as you've been out and about looking at jobs? Yeah, I would say the vast majority, um, by the time you determine what the budget should be, which I think is, is a critical success factor, right, in managing water, you've got to start with the budget. So, Jim, you're spot on there. Um, vast majority of the time, people are, um, are watering over the budget. You know, I, there's been a few exceptions uh, to that. Sometimes you see uh, um, some excep exceptions to that. But again, People might say, well, yeah, then, uh, you know, I'm not saving water. No, but if your landscape really is an asset and you're managing this asset to increase in value over time, you don't want a deficit irrigate. You want to make sure you're providing enough water so that the, the value of that asset does increase over the time. So again, what's the budget? You know, budget, but is it, budget isn't just about the water conservation, but it's about the plant health as well. And, uh, and I thought that was a really key point you made, Jim, is, is on the budget. And then, you know, Rebecca, to your point, managing that budget, you know, day after day, week after week, month after month, it's one thing to say, hey, look, at I got this budget, I should be using, you know, 100 units of water. Well, um, you could come back and you could be 20% high. And the board may, may say, well, hey, you know, what's going on? You're not managing it well. But the beauty of a smart control system is if it's providing you reports. Um, Jim, you gave a great definition of ET. There's several factors that affect ET. And you could have a, uh, a May of 2020 that could be warmer and windier and less humid than a May of 2019. And those factors will increase water use. So, so you, you have, again, this report from a management standpoint to say, hey, look, at, before it even becomes an issue with the board, I want to let you know we're going to be over budget and here's the factors that affected that and you have you know scientific data that, that shows that or it could be the other way around but um knowing what a, is going to affect your budget not just in the past but in the future as well as you're able to look ahead and say well, what's tomorrow's forecast what's the forecast a week from now what's the forecast 30 days from now and how am i how is my controller going to respond you know as richard as you like to say the future is now um, you know, it, it, we're, we're getting into some really exciting uh, water management um, aspects there. But uh, long-winded answer to a short question, but it, 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 the yeah. budget is key. <laughs> yeah. Information is the key here because one of the things that um, uh, we worked with Aquatrack to develop was uh, spreadsheets. And, and even got to a point where, I mean, the board members really relish that spreadsheet because it gives them last year, gives them year to date this year it gives a progress report every single month and we're not embarrassed about what we're doing. And, and if we're over, we have a justification for why it's over and we'll show that in a little red square and we'll color it red. If it's under it's green, you know, real simple, but you know, the board actually just, they go after, and we're doing the same thing on the golf course now. So for every golf course has got a spreadsheet, the common area has got a spreadsheet. So right now there's a minimum of five spreadsheets they're getting 
just to track the water on each one of those parts of the facility. And that information is part of the management report that every single resident reads. So what are you doing? What you're doing is you're educating. And, and all I can tell you is, you know, realtors say location, location, location. I would say educate, 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 because we're getting our, our not only our boards, but our residents are a lot more astute on what water management really means based on the input of a professional like Jim, Jim and then working with uh, Gothic out there. And, and just, we raise the bar all the way across the board. And I can't emphasize enough that that level of stakeholder management creates expectations every year of what we're gonna do. And I think it's easier to fund uh, additional things in the project because they appreciate and see the change and in the net savings every year. And so, and they, and they love rejoicing in that. So we review that every annual meeting, how well we did. And so I think that's something that I just don't wanna lose in this conversation that um, it just keeping everybody informed of what's going on makes a huge difference in its future success. Yeah, and I, I think that's really an excellent point. And I think that anybody who's ever bought a home in an HOA knows that one of the first questions they ask is, what is the uh, uh, annual fee or monthly fee for the HOA? And then they wanna know, are there any special assessments? Or have there been any special assessments? And they start to evaluate whether or not they wanna live there based on that. And high homeowner association fees make people shy away. So you can see how well things are being, being managed. So if we can actually help them reduce their cost um, and, and have that meaningful conversation based on this is the water we're, we're uh, uh, managing, I think uh, you're, you're light years away, in, in you're light years ahead and even helping the uh, property's appreciation. But it's a value proposition. And I think that uh, the thing our board, I took them when we were doing our landscape contract, uh, they went out and we took a look at all the properties managed by some of these other landscape companies. And we drove back into, I, I purposely left Gothic last because I wanted them to drive back into Grand and compare it to what they saw and the bus driver turned back to us, everybody in the bus and said, this is a nice looking prop we've seen all day. I said, okay, I think we're done. <laughs> but the point is that if you're managing your water, the thing is that what, what the board and what your, your management team is evaluated by is how well does a property look? That's the first thing that people comment when they drive into that entrance to that community is what does a property look like? Yeah. If it looks good, that means that somebody's doing something right and you can't do it right without managing the water properly. So all this background stuff is fundamental to success down the road. I right. can't emphasize that enough. Yeah. So Jim, if you're watering to budget as your point, you're really going to have the landscaping working its best. Yes. Uh, I, I have to emphasize right now that um, if, uh, if the turf, the turf is one of the biggest issues on any HOA and how that looks. Uh, generally what happens is someone sees brown spots in the turf and they think it's because you're not watering it enough. Yeah. And what it is, it's a head that's misaligned or clogged or it's a sprinkler head that's not working. Um, one of the things we do, and we are very successful uh, at Sun City Grand, and one of the reasons we are is the irrigation technicians there, every 30 days, have inspected all the turf. So that means that they're out there turning on systems, checking for misaligned heads, checking for broken heads, checking for leaks. If you don't have those inspections going on, you can't expect to have water savings. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. So my comment to everyone out there that's listening to this is, one of the most important things you can do on any property, any facility, is to do inspections on the turf grass, on the irrigation. And those inspections are vital. And so part of the reason why the turf looks so good as it does, whether it's on a golf course that we work at, or a university, or a city, or wherever, it's because we implemented an inspection system. Does everybody get that? That's really important. And we can do whatever we want with the scheduling, but everybody knows that if you have a poor distribution uniformity, poor uniformity of coverage, 
you have to increase the water to make up for the poor uniformity. So if you have good uniformity, that means that all the heads are operating correctly. You can decrease the water and have beautiful turf. So I just want that, I want that point to be made to people who are listening so they yeah. understand. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you for making that. So Rebecca at Rossmore, is the board looking at the water use on a monthly basis? Or are they reviewing that? Do they have a committee that reviews that? What, what, what's your experience? Not usually a committee that's reviewing the water, but uh, the boards, so we have at least 20 or 21 actually boards, um, and they each have their own water bills and their own people that look at that. Um, but consistently every summer in August, or, you know, whenever the irrigation system comes on for us, you know, right around May or June. Oh my God, the water has spiked. It's tripled. <laughs> and, it, and you always have to say to yourself, okay, yes, I understand that's very concerning, but you have to look at that compared to last year, because as soon as the irrigation goes on, it's going to pump up the, um, the budget. So I really appreciate, I can't remember who said it before, I think Jim or Andy actually, um, that, you know, one May compared to the next May might be completely different. And that's something that really resonates with me because we get that a lot. Um, but also something to speak to Jim's point about doing inspections, it's also important that people understand that even if you're doing a monthly inspection, which is very ambitious and great, you know, that you're doing it every 30 days, as soil expands and contracts, and as you have maintenance contractors coming through with mowers and machineries, Heads break every single day. You might check a system, walk away, five, minute later, five minutes later, it will break. Um, so if you have a broken pipe, it doesn't necessarily mean that the inspectors aren't doing a good job. It just means that an irrigation system is dynamic. It's constantly being pressurized and depressurized. Um, so yeah, inspections, inspections, inspections. And the more people you can get out there looking for stuff, you know, the irrigation usually comes up um, usually comes on in the middle of the night and for us we have residents and so people call in when they see a geyser or something that's indicative of a break and we send our irrigation techs out to do that and that's a really important component of our irrigation inspections because even if we do get around monthly um, those people are seeing it every single day that's it that's exactly right there's i probably get emails from people around the valley who live in different on different properties and they walk the property and they'll email me and say, hey, Jim, you've got a leak over here or there's something over there. And so it's never been, I don't see uh, those as complaints. I see those as other inspectors helping me out. Absolutely. Uh, as soon as we get the notice of, of that there's an issue, uh, we let the techs know they, they have, what we do is we know the area because all of our irrigation stations are mapped. So if someone says, hey, I'm over here and there's an irrigation leak, I can go online and I can turn the water off and then tell the tech that water's not going to get turned back on until you fix the leak. So they have a 24-hour window to get over there and get that fixed. Um, I, I just think that having residents also as inspectors helps a lot. Yeah, and also if you can organize it, which is not easy to do, but if you have contractors that you work closely with who will report back to you when they notice dry lawns, that's also really helpful because in the summer they're mowing every day um, and they may be out there and you know mowing and not really paying attention, but if you can implement a system where they can report back to you when they see issues, that's really helpful. Yeah, good point. And that's one of the systems that really impressed uh, the Grand Water Committee and the Grand Board is that uh, the Aquatrack system that Jim and his team uses uh, is very interactive, it's proactive. I'll never forget one of the uh, companies said, well, we, uh, we track all of, our, uh, all of our workers. I said, well, that's great. You know where they are, but you know what they're doing. And so uh, what Jim's system was is actually showed not only where they were, but what was being accomplished. So it was all reported back to a, uh, a drive and so it was very interactive and I could go in, anybody on the board or anybody that had the, had the um, password could go in and check and see what was being done. So, you know, the smart controls are really important, but you got to have smart people working on smart controllers too. So it's a combination of both. Uh, one or the other by itself doesn't work. It's got to work together in tandem. Yeah. Ken, uh, just going to say to that point, you know, it's the old saying about, 
uh, information, knowledge, and then wisdom, right? Information is cheap and plentiful. Knowledge is, well, this is what the information means, but wisdom is applying that knowledge and that information to get the results you want, right? And so uh, having, having, having the right tool, but knowing how to use it, I think is, is another way to say the same thing. Exactly. Like you got to know how to use the tool to get the results you need. Yeah, so, so Jim, besides uh, uh, smart controllers, um, uh, budgeting, what were some of the other things you did uh, or recommended for uh, Sun City? And most importantly, what, what's been the result? Well, um, the, the water bill at Sun City Grand uh, was a, almost was close, the total water bill was close to 1.2 million and uh, it dropped down to 740,000 in one year. So that's pretty significant. Uh, the rate of return, they were able to pay off their investment in the new equipment. And I'm not just talking about smart controllers. Um, they went out there and we upgraded to high precision nozzles out there. They did a lot of other stuff. Uh, we put in a lot of pressure regulating valves out there. We did a lot out there. And, but all of that was returned within three years. They've got a return on, they've got all their money back. So it's been smooth sailing for them ever since. Um, the other thing that we did is um, we identified 40 water meters out there that could be downsized because they wow. weren't used. So, so we had a two inch water meter running a, a, a system that only needed a one inch water meter. Well, the downsizing of that was a, was, was a minimal cost of $250, but the monthly cost reduction for having a, a, a two inch to a one inch, inch meter was like $175. So basically we were able to save, we downsized 40 water meters. So we were able to save about 6,000 a month just because we downsized the water meters. So that's one of the things that we did uh, we, we did a lot of improvements. Uh, we took poly out, poly tubing out and put PVC in. We did a lot of other improvements on the property. Um, but basically, uh, the total water usage out there for Sun City Grand, if you include the golf courses in the common area, is about a billion gallons a year. Wow. And the, and the, yeah, and, and all of it is regulated by the Arizona Department of Water Resources. So where Rebecca is in California, there's restrictions in Arizona. You have a limit or an allotment given to you by the state. And if you go over that allotment, the fine can be as high as $10,000 an acre foot of water, which is tremendous. So, so there, the state of Arizona, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the... Uh, they just did a, a new basin report for the Colorado River, and it just came out at the end of April. And basically what they said was, uh, since the year 2000, the temperatures have dropped 2% since the year 2000. And that the period from the year 2000 to 2020 has been the warmest period in 2000 years. Wow. So, so we've got a new Colorado River Basin report that's telling us that this 40-year drought is not stopping. It's not going anywhere. And so there has to be real conservation going on because if farms and golf courses and HOAs and municipalities are not getting the water from the, from the Colorado River or from some of the other rivers, that's surface water, then they're pumping it, Richard, out of the ground. Yeah. And aquifer water is limited. And so you have to, the Arizona Department of Water Resources has to guarantee to the federal government that we have an assured water supply that's going to last a hundred years. And that assured supply is threatened. So they've mandated a reduction of how much water is being pumped out of the aquifers. At the same time, we have the Colorado River and the the drought contingency plans just jumped in. So now we're taking less water out of the uh, out of the river, out of the Colorado River. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave us with water? Well, we have an uncertainty that we're all facing in these states, Arizona, California, Nevada. We're, we're facing uncertainty in the Southwest. So the only area they can go now, because they've already done all the reduction they can inside the home. 
your toilets don't flush like they used to, all of your appliances don't, all that's been changed. Yeah. So their only place they can go right now, the federal government feels, is outdoor into landscape water. And that's where the focus is. And that's why the state of Arizona has just now approved the new fourth management plan that reduces the amount of water that you can use on turf. And if the fifth management plan passes the way that, you know, that they propose, and I've argued against it, then it's even gonna be a greater reduction. These things are going to happen. They're in the works. So everybody in our area, Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, uh, California, we're all facing the same challenges because we can't deplete the aquifers that we're using. So that's where we're at. Yeah, and this is really exciting to me, right? Because um, uh, we do know the waste that's happening in landscape irrigation and there's room to, 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 to improve. And uh, I love it that the state's taking a tougher stance against it because really, if you can insure water for 100 years, who's going to move a business there? Who's going to move their family there, right? This is really the basic of, uh, of living in an area. So uh, that, that's great to hear, Jim. Thanks. Um, Richard, one thing that's interesting is since Jim has been on the property, and it's been what now, five years or so, Jim? Going Six. Six? Six years. I lose track, sorry. But since he's been there, one of the things that's really interesting is, is you know, as he said, all the residents, we have a, a really good work order system. They can just go right onto the website and just drop it in there. Wow. We have people that are very conscious about water use. So when they see water running down the street, they just freak out. So um, even in my little HOA where I live, uh, we have 90 homes. And uh, sometimes we have sloping front yards. So there's water that goes into the gutter. And I just cry every time I walk outside. But the problem is, is that... Um, they're not as willing to do something about it. In Grand, I'm telling you right now, it gets a lot of attention. So it's, it's really, what it's done is, is raise, the, raise the level of interest and education to a point where people are very focused on doing the right thing because they recognize it's not only the right thing to do, but it's also cheaper. And so I think uh, we've, we've reached a, a kind of a, a, a level now where I think the people have been educated to a point where I think any kind of new concepts for hires replacement or anything that's logical to do that we can ad advance um, knowledge and tech technology in the irrigation management side of it. I think that there is really, we don't have that, that big battle that you might expect. It's all of a sudden it's like, okay, show us what you got and let's see how it works. I'm a great fan since I'm an engineer. One of the things I'm really a big fan of is do your research get your results, publish your results, and demonstrate that they're repeatable mm. so that people have a confidence factor that they can move to the next level. And I, I would submit that to anybody listening, that if you do your homework, usually what they used to say in school is heavy homework gets the A, and actually that's not too far from the truth. So if you do your homework and get the experts in there to help you out, you don't have to be an expert, but you can become a subject matter expert but you get the professionals in there, and I'll tell you, it makes a big difference. That's why people like ET Water, people like Aquatrack, we rely on those people. We use the city of surprise. Uh, we've been engaged with the state water department. All those engagements really help strengthen the bonds among getting this all done. So I can't emphasize enough from a managerial standpoint, you need to do that, you lay that groundwork first, because that's going to make life a lot easier. Yeah, so Ken, would you say that was kind of your secret uh, in getting the Sun City Grand Board to move in the direction they did? And I, I think, I mean, such a big board, but they moved in a very rapid fashion. Was, was that the secret? Yeah, I think it is because it's, you know, the secret sauce is information, let's face it. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if you're trying not to do an emotional decision, but make it a rational business decision, again, I go back and I always say this to my staff. If you can't make the business case, then we're not going to present it to the board. So if you if we can make a good business case and show the logic, show the technology, everybody loves technology. But I, how many people buy cell phones and don't even know how to turn them on? Yeah. Well, I mean, what good is it? You know, we got to buy, have the technology there. And people like Rebecca and Jim and, and you guys at ET Water, I mean, the thing is, we rely on people like you that have that knowledge to help bring us and educate us. And I think that that's marvelous. But 
technology by itself isn't totally the answer. So stakeholder management is critical and getting the information. The professionals will help write the RFPs and do all that stuff for you. So if we rely on the professionals to help us get that done, uh, we don't have to do it all ourselves. Yeah. Well, That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's really important to go outside and, and, and get the help. So Absolutely. it's there. So, uh, so we know that, right, the way information is key, get a water budget, show the potential site saving, show the ROI, and then, uh, and then actually, um, you know, make your promises and honor your promises come through are key. Uh, one of the things we haven't touched on yet, and uh, I want to ask Rebecca about this, uh, is how about uh, training your teams to use the software or the smart controllers? Uh, uh, how does that go? What's your approach and, uh, and, and how can people make that better? The majority of our irrigation team does not have access to the, to the software. Um, the contractors have access to where they manage the irrigation. I have access to where we manage the irrigation and we have an irrigation manager also that does that. Um, so I don't really have any experience with training the crews on how to use the software. They're very familiar with making the clocks run the way that they want to. Um, but, you know, as far as the, the software goes, we were pretty comfortable with it. I know there's a new system coming out, so I can't speak to that one, but the old system, um, you know, it was user-friendly enough that we could understand it, but it was detailed enough that you could go in there and tweak those details that matter, especially if you have a site that's not normal. You know, maybe you have a lawn that's really root impacted and you have to change the depth or, um, you know, make these, these little changes that, um, that the system wouldn't otherwise know how to do. Um, so yeah, from, from that perspective, I have found it easy to use, and I know that uh, the contractors have found it relatively easy to use, and my irrigation manager has found it relatively easy to use. Yeah, great, thank you. And, and Jim, I know, uh, I know Josh Doris, and what a great job he does. Uh, how about some of your other team members? Uh, were they able to pick up on the software, use the technology okay? Yeah, so we have inspectors that are in the field. Uh, they have iPads, and uh, they go from one property to the next. Uh, they'll, I'll have them out inspecting different parts of the landscape. And so they're able, through their iPad, just to turn on the system where they have a form on their iPad that they fill out on what they see there. And then it generates into an email that gets sent to uh, whoever it needs to go to so that they can then work on the repairs. We, we do inspections and then the actual irrigators that work on the property do inspections. And so we work with them. Uh, I have my irrigators go out there. Sometimes uh, irrigation technicians will get pulled off of the irrigation because they're overseeding or there's something else that needs to be done and they just can't get to it. And so we partner with them. We don't, we, we go right in there and we start doing the inspections for them, help them out and, uh, uh, and, and it's worked out. I think as far as the training part of it, the use of it from, a, from an iPad and even the programming of it is fairly simple, but you have to have that information, Richard, before you can program it. That's why the audit is so important because yeah. when you're out there doing the audit, you know what, if it's a pop-up or a rotor head, you know if it's shade, if it's got a slope, you know all of that because it's all compiled in the audit. It's really difficult to just set something on the wall. Like if I go up to a, uh, a standalone controller that's got 24 stations on it and I wire it up to ET, well, I might have a little thing inside the controller that tells me this is turf and this is uh, drip, but it doesn't tell me about about the turf. It doesn't tell me if there's trees. It doesn't tell me if there's a slope. It doesn't tell me what kind of soil it is. So the audit is done prior to the installation so that you know what to input when it asks you these questions. And that I think that that's critical. And that's a step, just to give you an idea, if the controller is using a weather station that's telling it the ET rate. So it gets this ET rate and now it's supposed to water to put back in the soil, the ET or the water, the moisture that's been evaporated, right? Okay, well, it has to know what the precipitation rate is of those sprinkler heads that's gonna be doing it because a rotor puts out a different amount of water than a pop-up. And then there's, there's NPR rotors and there's all kinds of different types of rotors. 
If you don't have that information to plug into that controller, it, it's then it's garbage in, garbage out. You don't know what you're going to get. Right, Rebecca? <laughs> yeah, and even if you have the information, then you have to do a whole lot of math, right, to convert uh, uh, gallons per hour or gallons per minute to uh, inches per hour. And uh, uh, you've got all that to mess with, too. Where Well, the, if... if if you do catch cans test, you can get a pretty good uh, precipitation rate and a DU because when you program it, it asks you for the DU and it asks you for the precipitation rate. Now you can go to a manufacturer's uh, list and it'll tell you this is the precipitation rate for that ad. And yeah. you can use a default precipitation rate. But if you really want to dial it in, you, you need to do some catch can test out in the field. Yeah. Or, yeah. or there are other technologies that'll tell you the DU and what you're putting out there. But the catch can test is what most people are aware of. Yeah. yeah so um, throw in, Richard, can I just interject this? Uh, sure. Is that uh, we've been really fortunate that Jim has been very generous with Aquatrack's uh, time and some of his uh, training seminars he's held with along with even our staff and even the uh, Gothic team. And Gothic has been very generous in, in having these people attend and, and participate. So. I would say that it's a mutual effort between the professional uh, staff you have uh, from Jim's team, uh, the management team uh, from the, you know, the, the, of the organization, the association, but it's, and also if you don't have your, your uh, association landscaper uh, on board along with you, uh, it's not going to work because it's, then it becomes adversarial or it becomes nonchalant. And so I think it's critical that we had all those elements working together all the time. And sometimes it's just been so natural for us, I forget to even bring it up. But I, I think it's really critical that everybody's speaking of the same language and on the same wavelength, because that way uh, everybody just meets. And I know Jim meets regularly with the, uh, the landscape uh, irrigation auditors and landscape management team. And we have a little bit different setup the way we've organized our uh, landscape management there. But nonetheless, I think it's been just the communication level has been superb. And I got to give kudos to Gothic for um, spending the time doing that because I think the value is represented by how the property looks. So I just, I don't want to let that slide by without saying that. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point now. And Ken, if you had to just say, you know, a couple words on um, to, to help people, uh, what's the most important thing to get them to move their projects forward, right? We, we know it's going to save them money. We know it's going to work. Get the outside uh, experts, but uh, what, what's going to help push this along with the boards and, uh, and, and the uh, general managers and, and the property managers out there? Well, I, I think first of all, uh, number one, don't let anyone deter you from what you know your mission is, okay? Because sometimes there's a lot of detractors out there, but more importantly, I think it's getting the correct information to present to the board. And it isn't just the hardware. It's not just the software. It's a combination of the entire package. The value proposition needs to be made. And I think that that's the critical part because typically on these boards, they're, they're, they're educated people that are, are a lot of business people and have people that understand this. And they're making decisions in their business all the time. So I think it's really critical that you know, when we did the beta test, I thought that was so great. We had a one page sheet, comparison sheet, spreadsheet that Jim put together and his team put together so the board could understand, uh, you know, no matter what the salesman said, here's what we came out. And ET Water showed up better. And I think that was really, really cool. So I think it's really essential that we have uh, that kind of uh, information. So that's kind of where we're at. And I think that's really the big thing right there. Yeah, and well, and, 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 and I heard earlier, you know, information is everything, right? And sharing of this information and making sure it's transparent is, is really key. You know, I knew we had a good panel today, but I, uh, I am, I'm a really optimistic guy, but I really even underestimated the great value that we would get out of this today. Uh, you guys did uh, such a good job. We're really uh, down to the end of our time, but I did want to put this slide up and it's basically the contact information for all of you because I know people might have uh, additional questions or want some additional help. And I, I know you all said it was uh, okay to share this. So uh, here's everybody's contact information. I hope uh, the people watching out there 
Uh, we'll uh, uh, take advantage of this because it's really a generous offer. Uh, we've got some of the best water managers in the country, you know, on on this call and on this panel today, and and they're willing to help out. So, you guys, thank you so much. Uh, I, I thought today was really great. Uh, I really appreciate all the help, and uh, I hope we can have you all back again uh, very soon because. Uh, I, I feel like we uh, just really started to peel back all the information that's out there. But, uh, but uh, again, uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, I, I really do appreciate it. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, and thanks, everybody, for joining today. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.